Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for developmental psychology. In this lecture we're going to talk about the second half of cognition in middle childhood, specifically intelligence. We're going to look at intelligence pretty in depth. We're going to start by talking about intelligence. We'll actually then look at the history of intelligence. We'll look at some IQ tests and what have been done with IQ tests. We'll look at intelligence throughout the lifespan at least up until um, we get to those adolescent years. We'll look at some extremes of intelligence and we'll finish up with creativity. So first we have to answer the question, what is intelligence? So if we're looking at what is intelligence, we have to um, look at kind of a lot of things. The issue here is that there really is no one single universally accepted definition of what is intelligence. Uh, lots of people say it's different things. It's also why there's such a big, um, com or there's such a great amount of conflicting information on intelligence and what is intelligence and why there's some theories have one domain of intelligence, some have seven, some one domain of intelligence that was out there for a little while had over 300 domains of intelligence. So it does revolve around two central notions though. First off is the capacity to learn. So how good or how easy do you learn? And second is the capacity to adapt to the environment. So if there is challenging things in the environment, how well do you adapt to that? How well do you basically solve problems? So intelligence is going to be looked at as learning and solving problems. Just like how um, trait theory basically defined personality, the psychometric approach defines intelligence. They're the main approach that looks at intelligence. So what is psychometric approach? Psychometric approach is interested in measuring or quantifying something. So for intelligence, intelligence is going to be a trait or a set of traits that characterizes some people to a greater extent than others within the domains of that, what we were talking about on the previous slide, learning and problem solving. So it has to be something that we can measure and it has to be something that the, we can measure at, to a greater or lesser extent from one individual to another. So now let's look throughout history. And before I get into this, I do wanna say, I don't care about the names here. Um, if I put a question from these set of slides in, it's not going to, you're not going to be like, um, whose theory on intelligence said X? I might say this person, Spearman's theory of G, Spearman's G, um, looked at into what? So I give you, I gave you not only the person, but their theory and then asking, okay, what is it? I wouldn't ask you to tie a name to a theory though. That's a bit beyond the scope of this class. So we'll go through and, and give some names of how some things that happened throughout um, looking at intelligence. First is Galton. So Galton, who's actually a cousin of Darwin, really interesting fact there. Um, he said, whatever intelligence is, it must be unitary, one dimensional, and be able to be measured directly with something like reaction time. So he, he focused on focused on reaction time in his early tests. And again, this is the late 1800s. We don't have all the, all the things we have today, all the equipment we have today wasn't present. And he actually measured intelligence based on reaction time. Might seem like an arbitrary measure, but we'll actually come back to that later. Next was Spearman. So in the 1920s, Spearman, who, who now is viewed basically as the um, founder of intelligence theory, even if there was theorists before that, he, Spearman is the one who really pushed it forward. And he came up with the idea that, um, and what's referred to as Spearman's G. Spearman's G refers to the fact that we have um, basically one intelligence, and that is our general measure of intelligence. If there are differences from one test to another, let's say one test is testing your mathematical ability, another is testing your verbal, you, you have specific 
um, something specific to the test that might cause some variability in your intelligence. But really what it comes down to is, is this general intelligence we have. So Spearman said intelligence is a single construct or a single concept. Intelligence is one thing. Then later came along Thurston. So in the 1930s, about 10 years later, Thurston said, no, that's not good enough. There's just too much going on here. You can't define intelligence as one thing. So Thurston came up with instead seven primary groups or intelligences. And these are verbal comprehension, word fluency, number, spatial reasoning, associative memory, which is going to be your rote memory, perceptional speed, again, reaction times back there again, and reasoning. So for a long time, Spearman and Thurston, they were really just, they're, they're the, them, their grad students, groups that supported them were really just at each other. They, they really didn't like each other for a long time there because it was the really two opposing theories of intelligence. Today, we pretty much follow Spearman's G with some exceptions because Thurston's model couldn't predict intelligence better than G. It did start us on the path of multiple intelligences, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but Thurston's seven are not practiced by or followed by anyone today. There are other ones with multiple intelligences, but it's Thurston's seven are not it. It is very interesting though, at the end of Thurston's career, he's like, nah, Spearman's right. I, I, was, I was wrong, Spearman's right. And actually Spearman at the end of his career was like, no, nah, Thurston's right, I was wrong. So by the end, they had made up and were basically saying the other one was right. So I skipped a whole bunch. I could give you more things between the 30s and 60s that happened with intelligences and even more things in like the 70s. But really, I'm only going to give you two more. And that is the first one is going to be Cattle's uh, model of crystallized versus fluid intelligence. He went to multiple intelligences, but he didn't look at them like a lot of the previous researchers who'd looked at a bunch of different things and said, okay, well, verbal comprehension is different than mathematical ability. No, he looked at it as um, a difference between fluid, which is your ability to see relationships such as analogies, letters, numbers, and series. This is um, what we would refer to as our primary reasoning ability, our problem solving ability. So our fluid intelligence is our ability to see patterns and solve problems. Our crystallized intelligence, on the other hand, is related to our acquired knowledge and skills. It's our factual knowledge. And he basically referred to it as these are separate things. They're interrelated. You can be good in both, but somebody could be really good at acquiring knowledge and skills just memorization just memorizing everything but not necessarily good at solving problems somebody in the reverse could be really good at solving problems but isn't really good at memorizing facts so this to cattle this is the two things that separated um, these two domains of intelligence or our two sides of intelligence so crystallized, that's going to be someone like someone who's really good at Jeopardy. Whereas fluid is going to be someone like a scientist who's really good at solving problems. That type of thing. Then in the 1980s, um, along came Gardner. And Gardner basically, he still supported Thurston, even though it was 50 years later. Um, he he might have been a, a grandson of Thurston, a academic grandson, meaning his advisor was was a student of Thurston's, um, but he still supported. But he was and he he liked the number seven. He he still thought there was seven, but he changed them up, and based on a lot of the the science that had come along in the intervening years, so you still had verbal and mathematical and spatial. So these ones were were from um, Thurston's. So you, verbal comprehension mathematical ability, spatial reasoning. These are from the earlier ones. 
but he also included, interestingly enough, these two that, that pair together to be a different type of thinking. So musical ability and, and being a natural musical talent. Uh, just about everybody you see who are mus musicians spent years and years and years practicing. However, some people are better able to pick up musical theory and how to play an instrument and how to sing and stuff like that and how to keep beat. Some people are able to pick it up easier than others. That doesn't mean they're not, they didn't spend thousands of hours perfecting their craft, but they were able to pick it up easier. Those people have higher musical intelligence. Kinesthetic is about movement. So spatial is about being able to mentally move things. Kinesthetic is being able to move your body. So being able to be aware of what's around your body. So this is going to be athletes. Athletes who may, be, may not be high in verbal and mathematical ability, but are high in kinesthetic ability, the ability to move precisely, are have a high kinesthetic intelligence. And then we had these two, which is going to be interpersonal and intrapersonal. So interpersonal is your social skills. Gardner looked at your social skills as in intelligence. And intrapersonal, your ability to understand yourself. So he looked at that as another domain. Um, so these are supposed to be seven separate domains. What I can tell you is the verbal, the mathematical, the spatial, and to a lesser extent, the musical and the kinesthetic, all are highly intercorrelated still. Spearman's G explains those better, to a lesser extent with kinesthetic and musical. But interpersonal and intrapersonal are not as strongly correlated. They are definitely different than Spearman's G. The question is, are they intelligence? That's what the question now becomes. Is it these seven or is Spearman's G still the one? And I'm going to tell you right now, the, the majority of intelligence testers are going to be looking at Spearman's G even today. They don't discount Gardner, but they look at Spearman's G as much easier to measure and much easier to quantify. Let's look at IQ tests. So IQ tests, the early IQ tests were developed by Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon. So it was the Binet Simon IQ test. Um, they basically permitted testers to describe a child's mental age by the level of age graded problems a child could solve. Essentially, they, there was a series of problems and they had a whole bunch of kids of different ages solve them. And they said, okay, well, nine-year-olds, most nine-year-olds can solve this. Most 10-year-olds can solve this problem. Most eight-year-olds can solve this. So they had different questions and it was basically based on once you reached a certain age, you should be able to solve that problem. Nine-year-olds could solve more than eight-year-olds. 10-year-olds could solve more than nine-year-olds. So they developed it and basically said, if you can solve more puzzles or tests or questions than your age group, then you had above average IQ. If you solve less than your age group, you had below average IQ. So if an eight-year-old could solve nine-year-old problems, then they had a higher IQ. If an eight-year-old couldn't solve eight-year-old problems, then they had a lower IQ, that type of thing. And it was originally developed in France. I recommend you pay attention to what I'm saying right now. Um, was originally developed in France to identify children that may need additional education. The earliest IQ tests were to identify children in France who were behind, who were, who were lower than their peers in problem solving ability. So the original intentions of the IQ test were really good. It was to solve those who needed extra help. And it was based on Spearman's G and still based on Spearman's G, even if the test has changed now. The test is now called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scales. So Simon got dropped from it. Binet um, got brought to the US um, to, to create these intelligence scales, these tests that not just were for children, but were could be measured on adults too. Um, was originally actually used in the US to determine if immigrants would be allowed into the country. However, I asked the big question, what problems can you see this having? having? So you have to, to perform a written test as you first came to the country. Well, not only would you be fatigued from travel, but that's even besides the point. Even if you're not fatigued from travel, even if you're rested, you're well fed, 
all of that. If you're coming to the U.S. for the first time, and we're looking at back in like the 30s and 40s time frame, and um, the you're you're coming to the U.S. Uh, and you you get to New York, and you're given this intelligence test, a written intelligence test, and the instructions are in English, and you can't speak English. Guess what the tester is going to say? That you're less than, you're below average intelligence and you shouldn't be allowed in the U.S. So it came down to the fact that the test that was written in English and the U.S. version was written for English speakers and, and a lot of uh, people got discriminated against not based on their intelligence. When the question is, should we even allow people, should that even be a criteria? But that's an ethical question that I'm not even answering here. The, the problem is, is even if it is a valid thing to use, it wasn't used correctly because those who could speak English or spoke poor English or were from countries who, even if they could speak English, the the questions were in such a way, let's say you're, you're gathering uh, 40 acres of wheat and you do this and you do that. Well, what if someone doesn't understand what wheat is or 40 acres is so even if they could speak English they they might have been SOL because of the fact that the questions were written designed for people from the US so that brings us to um, the as as what does the IQ test mean what did they test so both the Stanford Binet and the Weschler scales form a normal distribution. Most IQ tests that are used today form a normal distribution. What that means is the scales are the they're distributed like this with the mean in the middle and they're spread around the mean um, to to equally around the mean. It's symmetrical. Each side is is equal. They're, so they're symmetrical bell-shaped around the score of 100. So the mean is 100. They have a standard deviation of 15, typically. Some have 16, some have 17. But they have a standard deviation of 15. So you've got 115 and 85. About two-thirds, it's actually about 68% of people, fall between 85 and 115. Then... You, you go out there, we've now got 130 and um, 70. And as you can see, the, the, there's fewer and fewer. So the higher this, this bar here is, the more people that fall in that range. So as you can see, as you get out beyond these numbers, fewer and fewer. And actually about 3% um, have scores at or above 130 and 3% have scores at or below 70 which is the cutoff for the old cutoff for intellectual disability the new cutoff for intellectual disability isn't a IQ score anymore they use IQ scores to aid them but the actual value is is not as important as how they do on functioning like everyday functioning Above 130 is our classification for giftedness. Uh, Mensa usually requires above 130, stuff like that. Um, the last time I was tested, which was about 15 years ago, I was up here at 165, which if you do the math, once you go out, it's about 1 in 10,000. So you about 1 in 10,000 people have an IQ that higher, higher. Um, I'm not saying that to brag, I'm just showing how how the IQ scales work. Now, that being said, IQ of 165 is, is great. However, it's not everything. So when we get to other sections, when we talk about things like motivation and how important motivation is, motivation, in my opinion, is just as important, if not more important, as intelligence. I'll, I'll talk about it more later when we're talking about it. I, I actually do have one slide later in this set of slides, I just checked ahead. I have one slide later in this set of slides that, that does talk about motivation, but um, if you have 
all the intelligence in the world but no motivation, it doesn't matter that you're you're super smart. Um, because you're you're not going to do anything with it. it. It really just doesn't matter. You need motivation to go along with it. And you can be less than average intelligence with super high motivation and go places because your motivation will allow you to overcome the below average intelligence. Let's go back to one of our favorite topics for this class, and that is nature versus nurture. So you'll recall nature versus nurture. We talked about how um, the biological forces and the environmental forces come together and result in, in behavior. And I even said it before, IQ is one of those classic ones because we know that roughly 50% of intelligence is accounted for based on genetics. So 50%, it's, it's a 50-50 split in general. There are exceptions, but it's a 50-50 split. So 50% of your intelligence is based on your, your genetics, your genetic makeup. So I, I mentioned that I've got a high IQ. Um, I definitely got that from my mom and my grandma. Um, my, my grandma always made fun, not made fun of, but made joke, a joke about my grandpa being about dumb as a box of rocks. So I definitely didn't get it from him. Um, but yeah, my grandma, even though she grew up on a farm, she's a farmer her whole life. She's super, she was super intelligent. My mom, even though she's never gone to college, um, she's been skilled trades at GM her, her entire adult life, but she is also super intelligent. So I definitely got the genetics there um, from, from through that lineage. Then 50, the other 50% is based on the environment, based on nurture. So um, that's where I had, uh, a, I went to good schools. Uh, I was the type of person who liked to read. So I spent a lot of my time in middle school and high school. Fortunately, a fifth grade teacher or fourth grade teacher read a uh, awesome book to us in class, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the first one. And, and I loved it from that point on. And I, I started reading and I, in, in fifth grade, I read The Stand, which is an 1100 page book, actually between fifth and sixth grade. But the, the point is, is I, I started reading young. So that really accounted for the, the nurture part, the environment part. And I, I never had anybody discourage me from reading, even though I didn't love school. I, I never had anybody discourage me from reading. I actually had encouragement on reading. So that really helped out. However, even though there's a 50-50, extremely poor environmental conditions can account for more than 50% of variance. If someone comes from an environment that is where lead paint or they're, they're starved or not getting proper nutrition, things like that, even with somebody who has genetics for high IQ is going to end up low IQ because of that, because of that environmental effect. Okay, um, so how does it work? It's, it's kind of almost a reciprocal though, because parents with greater intelligence, they're more likely than less intelligence parents to provide intellectually stimulating environments. So it becomes a reciprocal process, meaning that um, if you have genetics, good genetics for, for intelligence, you're likely to have parents who gave you an environment that was also good for intelligence, resulting in a, a compounding effect on it. And genes and environment, they then combine in ways that allow children with particular genetic makeups to display high intelligence under some environmental condition. But intellectual development is best when a motivated, here's that word motivation again, intellectually capable child gets intellectual nourishment from involved and responsive parents. Definitely didn't have that last one. Um, but uh, fortunately I had my books, so I, I, I got, I got my, my intellectual nourishment from books by escaping away from that, that wasn't necessarily the greatest. Sorry to drop that on you guys. Okay. Um, let's look at some other factors we know that, um, influence IQ. 
one of the ones that influences IQ is actually birth order. So firstborn children tend to score higher on IQ tests than later born children. And actually by the, the firstborn is the highest, the second born is the second highest, the third on there's really no difference. Why is this? Well, the actual reason that they believe this is the case, they don't know for sure, but they believe this is the case based on what are referred to as IQ fat cells in mothers. So there are certain cells, um, fat cells, that are around the hips and the waist. And these fat cells, um, the, they, they fill up in puberty and um, they, they basically are fat cells that are one-shot fat cells. Um, unlike most fat cells, most fat cells, when you expend them, they can be refilled. IQ fat cells cannot be refilled. They are, once they're depleted and they deplete late in pregnancy, um, basically during fetal development. And once they're depleted, they're gone. Once they're gone, they're gone. They're, they don't make up that much bulk, so it's not like something that's, that's that big of a, of a deal for size, but these cells, they, they deplete during pregnancy. And um, the first child gets the majority of them. The second child gets the rest. Third child on, there isn't any of these IQ fat cells left. And these are believed to be cells, the fat cells that, that aid in intellectual fetal development. It doesn't change that much, but it does change it slightly. We're talking on a magnitude when we're looking at IQ of like three to four, three to five points when you're sometimes even only two to three points. So two to three points between children. So the first child to the third child will only be about six IQ points above. And that is not much. You can barely tell that. And you really can't tell that without a test. Since I was talking about nutrition and environment, well, then fa another factor that influences IQ is going to be poverty. Because poverty includes low level of beating, meeting the child's needs, stuff like inadequate health and dental care and nutrition, living in overcrowded, unsafe neighborhoods, st chronic stress, relationship with parents may not be affectionate or supportive, lack of opportunities for cognitive stimulation, not as many toys, things like that. So when we look at it, one thing that, that is, does need to be considered is that poverty multiplicatively, there's multiple things from poverty that affects IQ. And that's why those who grow up in poverty average about 10 to 20 points below middle-class age peers on IQ tests. This 10 to 20 points isn't due to genetics. This 10 to, 10 to 20 points is due to those environmental factors. Another big factor, or sometimes big, sometimes not, factor that influences IQ scores is actually race and ethnicity. So one thing we know is that in the US, Asian American and European American children tend to score higher on average by about only two points than African American, Native American, and Hispanic American. The question becomes, is this due to genetics or some other factor? And in answer to that, um, even when you control for environment, even when you control for poverty and other things in the environment, uh, the, these groups that specifically African American, Native American, and Hispanic American still tend to score very slightly below US and Asian Americans, or European Americans and Asian Americans, not US Americans, but Asian Americans and European Americans. So there is possibly some genetic factor in there. It could also be the tests too, but we'll talk about that in the next slide. However, there is some evidence to indicate that genetics does play a factor, and that is with Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi Jews, um, they're a group of Jews that, that basically were predominantly in Poland, Germany, that region of, of Northeastern Europe. And they, they had a history of um, matchmaking. The parents would matchmake and the parents would matchmake those who were the, the best at being bankers and accountants and various different things like that. So the parents were being matchmakers and Ashkenazi Jews could only marry other Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, 
so you, really you had a lot of intermarriage that was people who were more intelligent. So there was a selective, not intentionally we, at the time, but there was a selective breeding program going on in Ashkenazi Jews to breed for higher intelligence. Uh, Einstein came from that. Uh, a lot of other, uh, like, I think it's something like 40% of Nobel laureates are Ashkenazi Jews or descended from. So there's definitely a very distinct or large group of people who who are higher average than average intelligence that came from this. And actually they score about 15 points higher on average than non-Ashkenazi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews. So it's it's very much there's there is a genetic component possible. Is it in the case in up in here? We don't know for sure. We know for sure here. We don't know in the others. And as I said, it's only about two points on average, and you cannot tell two points in IQ on anything other than a definitive IQ test. You just cannot tell on anything other than a straight up IQ test. So looking at, at problems with IQ tests, I said I would come back to this. That is the IQ tests have a very have a history of a cultural bias in testing. It's mostly been eliminated now, but IQ tests in used in the US were designed from chil for children from white middle class backgrounds. Um, those who, who basically had a different background had more trouble with IQ tests. Like I said, they've mostly fixed this now. Um, I can't say definitively that they've completely fixed it, but they have mostly fixed this problem now. There's also the stereotype threat, which we talked about before. But those who, who are judged to have qualities associated with negative stereotypes tend to do worse on those types of things. Since it's believed there's a stereotype that, that black people are have lower intelligence, there's a stereotype threat that's associated with that then on IQ tests when if that is not if that is not weeded out, controlled out in some way then it, it does end up resulting in many people doing poorer on the test than they would if they weren't if they didn't know about that stereotype threat. All right, let's go throughout the lifespan with IQ. We're going to start with infancy. Even though there is an IQ in infancy, we do start there. So the in infancy, there's the Bailey scales of infant development. Um, which referred to as developmental quotient or DQ. Um, it's used for infants from one to 42 months before they can take actual IQ tests from later. And it measures the in infant's ability to do things such as grasp a cube, throw a ball. Um, it does measure mental, so measure adaptive behavior such as reaching for an object when they should. It has a behavioral rating scale such as um, are they goal directed? Do they have emotional regulations, social responsivity? And again, it's now just like an IQ test though, it's taking how does a normal infant at that age do? And how is this infant doing in comparison to normal infants at that age? And we get that DQ as a comparison, developmental quotient, as a comparison of that, how that infant compares against others from the same, that are the same age. So while the Bailey scales are very useful in charting developmental progress and they can diagnose certain neurological issues um, early on, they are not IQ tests. There is actually no or very low correlation between infant DQ and childhood IQ. Only in cases where you've got um, neurological conditions going on, um, where do you get a association or correlation between DQ and IQ. For most neurodevelopmentally normal um, infants, there is no relationship. And in actuality, there's two things that um, researchers have found that later IQ is related to an infancy. First is attention. Speed of habituation, preference for novelty, things like that. Infants who, who uh, are better at holding attention on things 
and have a preference for new and unusual things, they tend to have higher, higher IQ. And going back to our good friend Galton, reaction time. Reaction time in infants is related to IQ in adulthood. And even in adulthood still, reaction time is related to intelligence. Individuals with faster reaction time tend to have higher intelligence. Just interesting stuff that somebody from the 1800s that really didn't have much to measure on, much research to go on, came up with reaction time as a measure of intelligence, and we came full circle back to it. Next, let's look at the child. So in childhood, children IQ scores um, the ones who fluctuate the most tend to live in unstable home environments. So if there's abuse, if there's various different things like that, various different attention and focus issues, it tends to come from unstable homes. Um, those who live in poverty actually drop in IQ as they get older. Um, there's a noticeable drop. So at the, the preschool, elementary, uh, early elementary school age, they tend to be much more equivalent to those from who, who come from non-poverty backgrounds. And as they grow older, that poverty um, the, causes them to get the, the difference to get greater. There is a difference to, at the start, but that difference gets greater because those who live in poverty drop in IQ. And those who tend to have increases tend to have parents who foster achievement and whose parenting is neither too strict nor too lax. So those who, who increase have good environments. So beginning at about age four, there, there's a fra fairly strong relationship between early and later IQ. We, we tend to have fairly high stability. Um, at least as far as the long term. And this is with the exception of those who are in poverty and things like that, but there, there does tend to be fairly strong relationship between early and later IQ. So it's, it's fairly, I wouldn't say it's exactly stable, but there's a strong prediction of later IQ based on early IQ. However, many children do show sizable ups and downs during childhood. Um, especially as new things are being learned as various different like uh during the summer iq goes down because people are kids are are not thinking about things in an academic way then in the school year it goes back up but within a group children standing in comparison to their peers tends to stay relatively stable from one point to another so kids who are smarter in third grade tend to be smarter in 10th grade um, even if there is, is ups and downs in the intervening time. So that's where the most stability comes in, is with that. Let's look at some extremes of intelligence. We'll look at the, the two different extremes. We'll start with intellectual disability, and then we'll talk about giftedness. So intellectual disability is defined as, and the de definition has changed slightly, but it's divine, defined as significantly below average intellectual functioning with limitations in areas of adaptive behavior such as self-care, social skills, and all of this has to originate before 18. Um, so you, you see the, the new definition is here a lot. So self-care and social skills. So it doesn't, the actual intelligence number doesn't matter. It used to be dictated by a score of 70 or 75, but that number is now no longer the case. So this slide is a bit old in that the, that number isn't definitive. The number is used as a guideline, but it's not definitive. It used to be you had to score below 75. If you didn't score, if you scored a 76 on your IQ test, you couldn't get any help from, from social services or the government. Now though, They've, they, through research, they found that even people who are as high as average intelligence tend to 
some of them can have issues with social skills and self-care and those individuals need the extra help that used to be only reserved for those who scored below a 75. So the, the number is less important as the deficiency in everyday functioning. Uh, as far as um, intellectual disability causes, there are thousands of known causes, hundreds, thousands of known causes. There are organic conditions such as all the bi different biological causes, um, heredity, genetics, um, diseases, injuries like traumatic brain injuries, uh, teratogens during um, pregnancy. So teratogens like alcohol use can, can result in it. But one of the issues with intellectual disability is there can be no identifiable organic cause. Someone could be low, it could be a combination of genes and environment. Quite often, we just don't know. So because of that, the, the definition we have has gotten much looser on what is intellectual disability. On the other end of the spectrum, you have giftedness. So the current definition of giftedness, and this has changed too, is having a high IQ or, big or there, big or, you can have low IQ and still be considered gifted, or showing special ability in an area valued by society. Um, visual and performing arts. You can have low IQ but do really good at visual and performing arts, and you're considered gifted because, again, giftedness, and this is where those other um, spatial ability, kinesthetic ability, musical ability comes in. So the current definition of giftedness isn't just high IQ, but you can have high IQ and, and be qualified as gifted, or you, you have to show special, exceptional ability in an area valued by society. Can't be just in an area that, uh, that's not valued by society. Maybe you're, you're the best person in the world at, at counting beans in a jar. That's not valued by society. That's not going to be considered giftedness. But in other things that are valued by society, that's where giftedness does come in. And the final thing I want to talk about relating to that is, and I've already said this, um, motivation. Mo uh, motivation is, is huge. Motiv high intelligence does not mean an individual do, will do well in their career. Just as important as intelligence is motivation to succeed. Um, the line motivation, it's not that I'm lazy, it's, that I, it's just that I don't care. So motivation is just as important, if not more important than intelligence. Uh, I failed out of the first college I went to. We already talked about how I'm high IQ, but I failed out of the first college I went to. Why? Because I had no motivation to go to class. My motivation was to sit in my dorm room and play video games. I didn't, I wasn't motivated to study. I wasn't motivated to crack the books. I wasn't motivated to go to class. So because of that, all of my intelligence that I had meant absolutely nothing. What was what was important there was my motivation, which I completely lacked. So take that as 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 a, a big thing to the big take home message. High intelligence is great, but it isn't everything. And even those with lower intelligence or even below average intelligence with high motivation can be just as successful as somebody who's got high intelligence because motivation is probably more important than intelligence. Now we can't talk about intelligence without talking about creativity. So if intelligence is our ability to solve problems, our ability to learn, creativity conversely is the ability to produce novel responses appropriate in context and valued by others. Big thing, valued by others. So it goes back to the same type of thing that, that is related to giftedness, that second category of giftedness, creativity falls into that. So again, creativity, it's, it's related to intelligence, but it's actually a different construct. It's a different field of thought. Whereas again, um, intelligence, solving problems, creativity, producing novel responses. So coming up with something new or relatively new. 
and it has to be in appropriate in the context and valued by others. IQ scores measure convergent thinking, converging on the best answer. This is something we talked about when we were talking about cognition. So converging on the best answer. So you go from basically premises and you get a specific answer and converging on specifically the best answer. IQ doesn't care about um, secondary answers. It only cares about the best answer. Conversely, creativity involves divergent thinking. So starting at big and coming up with new ideas that are, are from that. So divergent thinking or generating a variety of ideas or solutions. It, divergent thinking is, is more prevalent when there's no single correct answer. We look at things like architecture. Architecture involves both convergent and divergent thinking. You need to, the structure needs to be sound. However, architecture also involves creativity. It involves, because there, there's no one way to design the appearance of a building. So creativity comes involved there in generating variety of ideas, variety of solutions to the problem, as well as, again, novel responses and they again it has to be valued by others so for creativity i'm going to now go throughout the lifespan for most of the other things i've stopped in childhood or i've just talked about the category we're talking about and i understand that this is a middle childhood chapter um, but for this one i'm actually going to go throughout the entire lifespan because there's going to be one slide for the childhood, one slide for adolescence, and one slide for adulthood. It wouldn't make sense to just plop these individual slides in the middle of other lectures. So we're going to look at it throughout the lifespan. Starting with the child. So the child, preschoolers are actually have very high levels of divergent thought and creativity. So preschoolers, very creative. However, Creativity declines after entry into kindergarten and first grade. Why could you think, why might this be the case? Well, creativity declines because school promotes analytic and convergent thinking. School teaches us how to be convergent thinkers. It teaches us that there's one right answer and to get to that right answer. Now, there are some schools out there, Montessori schools and other types of schools that value creativity more. And in those schools, you don't see as much of a decline. However, even in schools that value creativity, you still see a decline in creativity as the, the um, child gets older up until about fourth grade. So it's referred to as the fourth grade slump. This is the period of time where cognitive development is at the point where creativity is the least valued. This is at the point where the the elementary schooler, the the nine year old, right around that time, eight to ten year old, is really focused mentally on getting the right answers, on convergent thinking rather than divergent thinking. And then it starts to raise a little bit, get, and after about the age of twelve. Um, into middle school, into high school, divergent thinking then rises again because now creativity, individuality, uniqueness, things like that become valued again. So this divergent thought and creativity increases again at the beginning of adolescence. Then let's look at adolescence. So adolescence, they regain the creativeness they had as preschoolers. Um, it's in adolescence, as it, you go through adolescence, creativity becomes highly valued. Um, they can produce highly creative work. Um, adolescents have increased creative feelings and you get things like curiosity, imagination, willingness um, to take calculated risks. Uh, all of these are increases in creative thinking creative feeling, divergent thought that comes in adolescence. Then finally, we have adulthood. So in adulthood, 
Um, this this creative production it increases steeply from the 20s to the late 30s. Um, and really, um, people are at their most creative, tend to be at their most creative in their 20s and 30s. So we look at most artists, not guaranteed, but most artists produce their most creative things, their most respected things in their younger years. That being said, creative production does gradually decline later on. Uh, in the humanities, um, productivity, which is related to creativity, it's related to both convergent and divergent thinking because um, scholars need to come up with new things. That's what's related to, to academia. You, you've got to keep coming up with new things. So productivity in scholars in the humanities peaks around the 60s and actually continues into old age. However, outside the humanities, scientists tend to peak in their 40s and decline in their 70s. So peak in their 40s, have a little bit of decline in their 50s and 60s, and then have to start, then start to de steeply decline in the 70s. In other domains like the arts, the arts, they tend to peak in their 30s and 40s and decline steeply afterwards. However, like I said, some people do their best artwork in their, their 70s, late in life. Some actors do their, their best work as they get older, but some do their best when they're younger, so, or most do their best when they're younger, with the few exceptions of those actors that make it huge. So that's just something to be aware of, that it declines at different rates for different fields. And that is one of the things when we get to adulthood that we will look at. Okay, so we looked at intelligence. We looked at a history of intelligence. Um, we looked at IQ tests. We looked at issues with IQ tests. We looked at the extremes of intelligence in both directions. Then we talked about how motivation is just as important, if not more important, and finished up with creativity and how creativity is, is in some ways a complement to intelligence. It is not dependent upon intelligence and looked at that throughout the lifespan. Thanks. Come on back.